time. Take it away, boss. Tank, we're going to need a signal soon. I got a fibrillation. APOC, location. Targeting almost there. He's going into arrest. Lock, I got him. Now, Tank, now. Cinderella Star. You want answers? We're on a mission from God. Unbelievable! Take your sticking paws off me! I'm afraid I can't do that. Have fun storming the castle! Hey everybody, welcome to Story Cauldron, finding the folktales, fables, and philosophies behind your favorite Hollywood films. I'm Bobby, the movie dude. I'm Anthony, the philosophy guy. I'm Garrett, and I just watch movies. So, Anthony, tell us what the uh, podcast is about. Well, all three of us like stories, we like movies, and... Uh, this podcast is an opportunity for us to sit and talk about the movies that we love and where these movies come from. Really, at the end of the day, it's all Tolkien's fault. Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien wrote a uh, uh, wrote a, a book and a long essay called "On Fairy Stories," where he talks about how all of the stories that we tell come from the same kind of soup, the same cauldron that uh, we we add our ideas to over the generations and then we just ladle our stories out so we take new stories and see how they're actually old ones all right and today we're checking out everyone's favorite movie from philosophy 101 the story of a game addicted white collar programmer who uses cheat codes to whoop some butt that's right it's the matrix y'all the matrix so uh let's start off with the like well telling everybody what the movie's about just in case they haven't seen it um, I vote you. <laughs> so we uh, the movie opens up. Uh, you see a hacker, and uh, his computer starts talking to him. And he's wondering if he's in a dream state, and he's told to follow the white rabbit, which leads him into pretty much a rabbit hole of reality. Ba-dum-bum. And <laughs> yeah, a rabbit hole of reality, and uh, which is different from actual reality and the Matrix. And everything just goes straight into old philosophy. So uh, we're going to get started with some of that. Yeah, this movie, uh, I think this was the first rated R movie I ever saw. I, really? I, it's the first movie I remember seeing where I was conscious that it was rated R. Because, you know, I was a, I forget how old I was. I think I was in middle school maybe when this came out but uh it came out in 1999 and it was a it was a very successful film almost right away people recognized that this was new this had uh, some new techniques in it for cinematography it won several awards actually it won four different oscars for things like visual effects sound effects uh and it, it it did quite well right away, and and I I remember I didn't I never was obsessed with it the way some people were. Some people really got really <laughs> got into it. Really, uh, but it's it's a really fun movie. It's 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 exciting. The pacing is great. Um, you know, it 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 intercuts these really fast action packed sequences with these really kind of calm philosophical monologues and. Uh, and yeah, so there there's a lot to talk about here. Oh, there's tons. And it's uh and b- beyond all that, it's just a really great movie. In fact, it's the first movie where I actually saw color grading in at work, you know, because mm-hmm. you know exactly when you're in the matrix. Um so yeah, we have uh what well, first time I saw it, I was actually in my philosophy 101 class. <laughs> Go figure. And uh I loved it. I mean, I didn't watch it up until I went to college in 2007. I think I had that philosophy class, and it was uh, <laughs> eye-opening. And that's uh, where a lot of people uh, will encounter it because it does play with several huge concepts in in Western and Eastern philosophy. So it's it's a great teaching tool, and and plus, like you said, it's a great movie. So it's it's always a good, uh, good excuse to watch it's it. It's a conversation piece. Yeah. <clears throat> um, that's true. Oh, uh, well, the first time that I watched this movie was this morning, <laughs> and I didn't even really get through the its entirety. But what I did see, I liked, and it was very intense. And I just, 
my stomach is a nuts because it was just so much so fast. <laughs> <laughs> but I liked it, what I, what I saw. Cool. Well, we can... We can start by just kind of looking at the surface level stuff. You know, here on, on the story culture, we always want to go deeper to look at, at the, 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 the roots of, of the story. But on, on its surface, there's a lot of references that this movie makes to other things that people will be familiar with. Alice in Wonderland is referenced frequently with the, the white rabbit and uh, going down down the rabbit hole and, and yep. swallowing things. That was like <laughs> the first thing I picked up on. And then I think possibly the only thing I picked up on without your guys' help. Oh, really? Okay. So, and, yeah. well, and well, okay. But then I, I, when it came to the names, I started picking up more and stuff, but yeah. And that's, was, that's another one surface yeah. level kind of, uh, kind of stuff. The names of a lot of the characters are referencing other things like Greek philosophy or Greek mythology. And, yeah. And, uh, Christian theology and, and things like that. What, uh, uh, I don't know. Who should we start with? Well, uh, I, let's right at the very beginning of the movie. I don't, I would, this is what I always think of. Uh, the guy comes in, pays Neo $2,000 and says, man, you're like my personal Jesus, <laughs> you know? So, why not start big? Yeah. Oh, with, with Jesus? Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 Jesus gets a lot of shout outs in the movie. People are constantly looking at uh, at Neo and either using that as a as, as a as some kind of profanity or, or just kind of muttering under their breath. They're constantly looking at Neo and calling him Jesus for one reason or another. Yeah. Because he basically is. Yeah. Well, if, end you, of it. if you take a look at the whole thing, it's it's a a savior he's story. The, he's the savior. And, uh, and his companion, Trinity. Yeah. I just, mean, uh, how, how Christian can you get? Yeah. <laughs> right. And even uh, uh, there's, some, there's some biblical references to the name of the ship that they're on, the Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, when, when they come out of the Matrix and, and they're flying around on this futuristic ship uh, commanded by Morpheus, the Nebuchadnezzar is named after a king in the Bible mm -hmm. who has a lot of dreams. I mean, there's a lot of things that happen with Nebuchadnezzar, but in the book of Daniel, he, more than once, he has these these dreams that need interpretation. He's disturbed by the dream. He doesn't understand what it means. And then, you know, the prophet has to come and explain things to him. So it's appropriate that for these people dealing with this dream world of the Matrix, that they're flying around on a ship named for a dreamer. And, yeah. and uh, Morpheus, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was the Greek god of dreams, right? I think, I think uh, that's right. Dreams or, or of, of sleeping and nighttime and slumber I and all that kind of stuff. Right I just watch all the movies, too. man. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, um, you know, th those, uh, th those are the kinds of things that we can see pretty easily. We want to go... We're going to go deeper. So what, when you're in your Philosophy 101 class, what kind of stuff are, are you talking about with The Matrix? Should I start with the, uh, like, the one that was really driven home? Let's do that. Uh, okay. So if you're listening to this, I'm assuming that you're familiar with the allegory of the cave. Ah, yes. So. Good old Plato. Yeah, and uh, we'll leave it to the philosophy guy to tell <laughs> us exactly what the philosophy of the cave is in case uh, some people don't know, but it's it's a pretty popular one. Okay, yeah, so the allegory of the cave is uh, arguably one of the most famous things that comes from Plato's philosophy. Plato was a, a, a Greek philosopher who lived... Um, in I think it was the fourth century BC, and he writes all of these dialogues, these, these almost like scripts for plays, following the adventures of his teacher Socrates. And in the Republic, which is the name of one of Plato's uh, most famous works, he has Socrates talking with a group of people about justice and about things like knowledge and, and the real world, and. Plato has Socrates tell this story to kind of illustrate what the world is like. He, he tells this um, almost like a, like a fairy tale about a bunch of people trapped in a cave and they're chained up and they can't move at all. They can't even turn their heads around. All they can do is look at the wall in front of them. 
and <laughs> behind them sorry the, shadow puppets shadow. I, I always think of who has the dog on the wall you know <laughs> yeah yeah well that, and that's exactly what's going on they're staring at these shadow puppets of this fire that's burning behind them but they can't even turn their head to see the fire or, or anything like that all they can see are these shadow puppets on the wall and so that's what they think is real because that's they've lived their whole lives staring at the wall and all they know are these shadow puppets but uh obviously they're it's just you know when when compared to the real world shadow puppets are yeah. flat and fake and you've got a puppet master and then you you know if you're born in the cave and the, all you see are these shadow puppets, that's your reality. Just like if you're born into the Matrix, all you're going to know is reality is the Matrix. So, Which is interesting and believable and, and it seems real, but compared to the real world, uh, it's missing something. Like spoons. Like spoons. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, Plato goes on to have Socrates talk about the philosopher, the person who manages to break free from the chains in the cave and stumble out into the light of day and stumble out into the light of the sun and learn what the real world is actually like. Uh, and But then the, the crucial thing is that the philosopher actually goes back into the cave to try and wake up more people, to try and tell people about what is really going on and to try and help them see the truth about their chains. So for, uh, for Morpheus and for all of the, the crew members on the Nebuchadnezzar and especially uh, by the end for Neo, you know, they are trying to wake people up. They even use that language in the movie, don't they? They talk yeah. about waking up, waking, them waking up. up a mind um, and how difficult it is to accept uh, you know, that, that everything that you thought was real was actually fake. Um, this, for Plato, this is the project of philosophy as a whole. You're trying to get people to think about what they take for granted and, uh, and be critical so that they can pursue the truth, so that they, they can focus on what is really real, just like how in The Matrix, uh, you can't focus on anything that's real because everything is just being fed to you through a tube in your skull. Yeah. Yeah. So, speaking of the tube through the skull, there was one other thing that was driven home during what, this movie while we were watching it, and that was Descartes and his philosophy on, like, simulations and are, are we really here? Are we really doing what we think we're doing? Right. Yeah, Descartes is a, uh, a philosopher who lived mm, uh, quite a few centuries after Plato. <laughs> he was a, a Frenchman who, who lived in the 17th century. And Descartes are arguably is where a lot of modern uh, Western philosophy begins. But in his book, Meditations on First Philosophy, he was trying to... He, he was obsessed with what it means to really know something. How can I know that what I know is actually real? How can I be certain that this is true? Mm -hmm. And so he tried to break everything down. He said, I'm, go I'm going to doubt everything. I'm going to uh, pretend like I know nothing for sure. And then I'm going to try and see what I can actually be confident about. And uh, and, and he was concerned about this because he thought may, maybe, I mean, I, I, I think I know a lot. I think that I'm, you know, sitting at a table right now. I think that I'm smelling the air. But maybe, maybe there's this evil demon that's feeding <laughs> these. And I know it, this, he really talks about this this way. Maybe there's this evil demon that's feeding me lies. And that maybe I think I have 10 fingers, but actually I don't. Uh, that it's just this evil demon tricking me into thinking I have 10 fingers. So how can I be sure of what I do and don't have? And he eventually comes to uh, uh, the, this rather famous statement um, in first philosophy, Kogiko or Kogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. He said, basically, if nothing else, I can be sure that if I'm if I'm having these concerns, if I'm having these doubts, um, arguably he he really stole this from Saint Augustine, but yeah, you know, we'll just leave that aside. Uh, <laughs> if I'm really having these doubts, then at the very least, 
I exist and I, I am here doing the thinking. And, and then from that, he, he manages to somehow conclude that God is real. And because God is real and not evil, therefore, I can trust my sensory information. But mm -hmm. I'm skipping over a lot there. Well, yeah, that was like the, the cliff notes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, going back a little bit um, where you were saying there's the evil demon that's mm -hmm. feeding him lies. You, you see that very blatantly in the movie of the guy, I can't remember his name, um, the Judas character. Uh, oh, Cypher. Uh, yeah, Cypher, yeah. With the, I know that the steak should be juicy and delicious because that's what I'm being told. And I don't know. Personally, that's terrifying. And I think it is for most people. <laughs> the the yeah. possibility that mm -hmm. that's accurate. To think that your thoughts aren't your own, that they're just being fed to you. Yeah. And it's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately because one of the biggest trends right now, I guess, on YouTube is to discuss conspiracy theories and stuff like mm -hmm. that and one of the biggest ones is um the simulation theory and everybody's going and talking about it just saying well <laughs> well yeah and not just on youtube it. Yeah. yeah i mean elon musk the tesla yeah. guy that's who they great. always go back to as like a lot of people say he's kind of the brain behind it and he's really smart because he invented tesla <laughs> um <laughs> well i mean he is very smart but he definitely did not invent, did not invent it no yeah. no been talking about it for two thousand years yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly and then uh well the way the simulation theory was kind of put into my mind was that um, once a civilization gets enough computing power to run all these different simulations, uh, it kind of opens up a can of worms to where there are alternate realities of where did I eat eggs for breakfast or did I eat oatmeal for breakfast, you know, and there's there's always a choice and therefore there's always simulations and it's like the multiple multiverse, I guess, right? Well, yeah, and how can you be sure? So the argument, I, I'm going to be honest. real? I'm <laughs> not convinced by the simulation hypothesis. Um, I'm not that worried about it. Uh, but it is, it, it, it sounds really bad because the idea is if it's possible to accurately simulate the world like the, Mat like the Matrix does, yeah. then you have a statistical unlikeliness that you are living in the real world because just by the probability game, you have way more chances of living in a simulation than you do of living in the one real world out there. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm not that troubled by, the, by that kind of skepticism. I like, there, so there's an a, a English philosopher, G.E. Moore, whose response to this I thought was perfect he basically just said um here is one hand here is another hand therefore skepticism is wrong <laughs> like, like I, I have basically i i have these these experiences that i really do have hands therefore um you don't have to uh cast doubt on on everything the way that that you're doing so it's mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm kind of walking over that a bit um, roughly, but but basically, Moore said, "I have these hands. Prove me wrong." And that's the, that's one of the troubles with the simulation theory is that you can't really prove that it is true. And then people will say, "Well, you can't prove that it's not true." Like, but yeah, but yeah, proving a negative <laughs> is kind of a uh, kind of an impossible thing to do anyway. So wait, are you telling me that Community had it wrong with the darkest timeline? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if this is the we we might be living in the worst of all possible worlds, but that's uh, a different philosophical problem. Yeah. Puzzle. Exactly. <laughs> <clears throat> so, well, I mean, what would you? And that that scene that you were talking about with Cipher, where he's talking to the agent about the steak and, and how, how he doesn't care. That's that's kind of the whammy line in that that mm. scene. It says, "I know that this is false, and yet I don't care." I don't. Do you think there's something to that? It, would you would would you be happy in the Matrix? Do you think, or is there something about the real world that? Well, he is does better? he does mention to Agent Smith. He's like, "I just don't want to remember any of the other stuff." Yeah, that's true. So, I mean, he's he's basically rebooting himself, and he's saying that I want to be Reagan. <laughs> yeah. yeah, nice little Ronald Reagan dig there in that scene. Um, Maybe an actor. I don't know. <laughs> an actor. Well, the thing for me is that if I didn't know, of course I wouldn't care. Like, because I'd just be living my life, and I'd think that these thoughts are my own. So. Yeah, but, I mean, given the choice, if you already have it peeked behind the curtain, you, you consciously say, I don't want to remember any of this because I don't care. The whole red pill, blue pill choice. Yeah. Would you take the red pill or would you take the blue pill? 
Notably, both of the Wachowskis, the directors who made this movie, have said in interviews that they would take the blue pill. They would they would be happy to stay in the Matrix and not not find out. I would, I would dig that. I don't know. It's it's I'm. I'd like to think that I would take the red pill. I think everybody wants to imagine themselves that they would be the the courageous pursuers of truth. But it's hard. It's right. difficult to do that. And I feel like it's you'd scary. have to be super good at computers. Yeah. And I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> well, or they well they can always just you know download the information into your brain. Apparently. Oh, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Want to cook on a hibachi? <laughs> 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 I well, and that. I, I do think there is something to that, though, right? How we imagine if that was all you needed to do in order to become an amazing painter or an amazing dancer or something like that. If if you didn't really have to work at it, would wouldn't that? It seems to me that that would water down the value of the skill. It's true. Oh man. Oh man. I. My brain just exploded. So this is this is kind of we're we're touching on another um, philosophical puzzle from uh, a guy named Robert Nozick, who in the seventies, I think it was, maybe early eighties, I think I think mid seventies, he wrote a um, he wrote a book where he was trying to disprove what's called hedonism. Hedonism is the idea that you should live for pleasure, that pleasure is all that really matters, that you should try to maximize as uh, pleasure as much as possible and minimize pain as much as possible, which is not, I mean, that's generally a, a good principle to follow, but hedonists will say that that's all that matters is pleasure and, and pain, uh, you know, avoiding pain. And Nozick tells this, this thought experiment about what he calls the experience machine. Uh, which, if you plug yourself into the experience machine, you will live in a simulated reality, basically, where you will be perfectly happy. You will constantly be feeling nothing but pleasure. Would you plug yourself into the experience machine, he asks? Or would you say that maybe the struggle of life is satisfying in itself, that, that, that we need those kinds of failures to give context and meaning and weight to our actions. Uh, I, I, mean, I think it's funny in The Matrix how the agents say that the early models of their dream world failed because they tried to make it perfect. And, uh, oh, I forget the line now, but um, Hugo Weaving's character said something about how humans want to suffer. We just don't, we, we couldn't take it. We couldn't, uh, we, did, we didn't buy it. Mm. And that uh, people were rejecting the programming when everything was perfect and happy. Yeah. Because hmm. what makes a good story? Conflict. Well, that's true. Yeah, you're not going to have, uh, you're not going to have story without conflict. And, and uh, you're not really going to have life without some kind of story. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. All right. I, I'm a brain gone. Um, <laughs> uh, wow. <laughs> So, we, we've talked about, uh, you know, all the, the Jesus tropes. We even mentioned the Judas character. But, I mean, you have a lot of Eastern philosophy that goes along into the movie. Also, mainly Buddhism. What are your thoughts on that? Well, Philosophy 101, unfortunately, does not often get into Eastern philosophy. whole different class. <laughs> it, yeah, which is unfortunate because, uh, I mean, granted, yeah, we live in, in kind of a westernish civilization but um philosophy in in the west kind of follows from the greeks and uh and and what happened on the european continent and then in in america but meanwhile you know the in india and china and japan there were entire brilliant civilizations developing their own philosophies which oftentimes take different starting assumptions that uh, than than we do in the West, and sometimes that leads to very different conclusions about things mm -hmm. like ethics and metaphysics and epistemology. But sometimes it doesn't, and that that's when it's really interesting to see where Western and Eastern philosophy tend to coincide and and come up with very similar sounding ideas, like like here with the idea of the bodhisattva. So a lot mm. a lot of people will know the. Uh, words like nirvana and enlightenment <laughs> and things. But uh, in Eastern philosophy, 
and 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 especially in Buddhism, your your goal is is to try and reach this this state called enlightenment. And there's there's a lot of different ways to talk about this. You you can't really talk just about Buddhism as if it's just one thing. There's lots well, yeah. of different varieties yeah. out there. True. But one of the more prominent ones is called Mahayana Buddhism. And, and the idea there is that we're trying to do it together. It's not just about you going and reaching enlightenment all by yourself, but we're trying to reach enlightenment as a group, kind of. And so the bodhisattva is the person who reaches enlightenment and then helps others to achieve it as well. So mm -hmm. it's, it's very similar to the philosopher coming out of Plato's cave, learning the truth about things, and then going back into the cave to uh, help others. Yeah, trying to like coax them into exploring for themselves. Yeah, because you can't force anybody to do it. You can't yeah. force anyone to reach enlightenment. You can't drag anyone out of the cave, really, because um, uh, that causes them great pain. There's a, there's a nice line in in the Republic where Plato talks about how people's eyes hurt under the light of the sun if they're when they're dragged out of the cave, which is very similar to what uh, what happens when. <laughs> Neo. Neo wakes up. Yeah, yeah. When he wakes up. <laughs> it burns. <laughs> oh, and isn't that such a great line, what Morpheus says? Such a uh, heavy oh. moment when he asks why his eyes hurt. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. because you're just barely using them. Yeah. You're not used to using them. Ah. You think you've been using them for 30-something years, but... But you haven't. Yeah, now Everything is just starting to click. All the brain all pictures. The yeah. <laughs> And, and so the bodhisattva in Eastern philosophy is, is very similar. The, it's the person who helps others jump into the great vehicle and, and, and try, to, uh, try to come to understand reality. Mm -hmm. So Neo is, uh, is very much playing the role of, of the bodhisattva. Uh, uh, by, by the end, he, he, you know, he's this reincarnation of, of yeah. this previous Buddha, uh, this this earlier one and and now he is flying around he's got superpowers by the end of the movie <laughs> flying around awesome well i mean what what else would you do if you were the one in the matrix that would that would clearly be the yeah. first thing i would do is go and fly well then that when they're amazing. uh they're in the ship they're about ready to get attacked by the machines and neo's still in the matrix getting his butt handed to him by agent smith yeah. You know, and then he starts fighting back and everybody's like, whoa, <laughs> you know, they, uh, he, Morpheus says something that kind of stuck out in my mind. It's like, he's, he's starting to believe, okay. you know, and that's like, you know, reaching enlightenment mm -hmm. to where like he, he dies in the matrix. But when you die in the matrix, you die in real life. He didn't die in real life. He came back. Yeah. It's so, I mean, he, he just reached like what pinnacle enlightenment there or I, he transcends something. I don't know. Does it actually show his heart monitor? Doesn't it? Yeah. And then he dies. Like he stops yeah. and, then, and then he comes back to life. <laughs> so it is a resurrection moment. So yeah. kind of a, that, and that's more the Western influence there with well, yeah. the Jesus trope again. But, uh, but he comes back and he has total command of yeah. his surroundings. He is. And he's, he's very Zen like afterwards, right? You were, you were laughing about how bored he looked, Garrett. <laughs> yeah, he was like, uh, just all this fighting is happening in his just his face. Oh yeah, I'm I'm here doing this, and then turns around, starts fighting with one hand, <laughs> totally whooping this guy, and then oh, this is just a thing I'm doing today. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I got to go pick up the kids at three thirty. It's like, <laughs> come on, man, you're like beating a guy up. It was insane. It, it is a real satisfying moment at that point in the movie. After all the other people have been killed and and. And and they, it seems like all hope is lost now. The uh, what what Tolkien calls the U catastrophe. I was just about to ask, like, what is that word called that word. he uses? Every, all hope is lost. I, I hear it coming up. And, and then 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 the magic comes comes back in, and and you've got the happy ending. Um, and I like that they leave this one open ended. I know the the sequels to this were rather controversial. Yeah, uh, yeah. They, they did not have nearly so unified of uh they, they were not nearly so popular across the board i mean they were they were still interesting and made made some good money they were an entertaining they're entertaining yeah. yeah maybe not quite as coherent <laughs> yeah not, not quite as clearly making 
the points that this one was making. But <laughs> the really, philosophy doesn't come out and just slap you in the face. You know? uh, <laughs> just really cool fight scenes, though. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that, I mean, those, those they're, impor- the they're important. Yeah. Um, the uh, the uh, one other thing that uh, that I think you really can't talk about the Matrix without talking about is the idea of the hyper real. Mm. And there's a couple of times in the movie where a book by a French philosopher, Jean Baudrillard, is mentioned. And you actually see it. It's at the very beginning when Neo wakes up at the computer and and, uh, the guy's knocking on the door. And -hmm. and he opens up the book that he's cut the inside out of to store his bootleg computer chips, whatever that is. That's uh, a book by Baudrillard called Simulation and Simulacra. Or Simulacra and Simulation. I always get those backwards. Uh, This is a book that came out in the 80s that talks about what Baudrillard saw our culture moving towards, where you, uh, well, imagine a a copy machine where you make a copy and then you take the copied piece of paper and make a copy from that and then take another, you know, take that copy and you make another copy and you just make copies and copies. And and eventually what you have (laughs) looks kind of like what the original was, but it's different. It's not, you know, it's it's kind of its own thing. You get the worksheets that you had in elementary school <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's a simulacra it's it is a copy of a copy of a copy that takes on its own life and, and no longer really refers to the original it just kind of refers to itself it's a, a simula, and that's that's the hyper real it's not real it's not you know referring to something that is actually in the world it's it's kind of referring to its own cyclical self it's a it's a it's an odd idea and and um Baudrillard gives a, a few different examples and like he talks about Disneyland in the book how Disneyland is this city this this small town which isn't really real that there's not a small town that's actually like that where everybody's perky and happy and dancing in the streets all the time but it looks like one and and maybe yeah. other cities have tried to pattern themselves that's where simulacras really become interesting is when people take the simulacra and assume that it's real and try to live in some way based on the simulacra and so then they're kind of making the simulacra which is not real real and it just kind of perpetuates this cycle (laughs) it's it's a tricky sort of complicated notion that i think you can see in a lot of ways with how we we take uh, uh, i don't i don't want to talk about fake news but you could maybe talk about fake news in that direction you could talk about uh uh a lot of the ways that we try to draw lessons from television shows or yeah. I, if I remember right, I don't remember if it's Baudrillard or someone commenting on Baudrillard. They talk about things like pornography and uh, how, you know, we, we take things to be true, which really aren't. It's not an accurate depiction of how the world really works, but we like certain things about Disneyland. And, and so we pretend like, that's the way real life is, but <laughs> leave it to Beaver was a long time ago. And I, I was about yeah. to make a Donna Reed reference, but I decided <laughs> I'd suppress it. <laughs> I'm just thinking to myself, we've got, you know, Main Street USA from Disneyland, drop it into actual Anaheim and <laughs> yeah. see how long it takes for, you know. Yeah. I bet the squirrels would be happy. To happen. <laughs> yeah. And, and so the Matrix is, you know, you're living in a simulation, but, um, the a lot a, a lot of the a lot of the points that um, you can make about this movie and about the like the philosophical ideas we've been discussing are almost like a cautionary tale to avoid avoid allowing it to become a simulacra as technology continues to grow and and become an ever more present part of our lives. Beware. Artificial intelligence is Artificial. terrifying. <laughs> well, yeah. If there's one message that this movie is trying to underline, I think it's that, isn't it? Yeah, well, I just, from looking at that, that was what it looked like, well, what people thought it would look like in the late 90s, and now looking at where we are today, it just, it seems like it's slowly becoming more and more real, but it's in a way of, all of these movies have been made, isn't, aren't any of these scientists paying attention (laughs) before this goes in a bad direction? I've seen Terminator. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's just, it's just like that thought of, um you know, how far is too far and who's going to take it too far. And Uh, I think this movie is an excellent depiction of something that just goes too far. Uh, With the reliance that people had on technology? Well, reliance people have on technology and then basically just the technology taking over. Mm -hmm. What got it from point A to point B, where it was, oh yeah, like we have a television now to, 
oh yeah well, this is not real this is all the matrix you're fake yeah, baudrillard has some very <laughs> vr um, headsets <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right oh how how disturbingly ironic would it be to watch the matrix in a oh. vr headset <laughs> I'm just waiting for them to reboot the Matrix because I think at that point that's when Baudrillard will start rolling over in his grave if he's not already <laughs> because you'll be s- simulating, the simulating simulation. The simulation, right? I like that. Oh boy! And there's actually even a quote from Baudrillard in the movie when Morpheus is explaining the Matrix to Neo, and they go into the the room where it's all white, and they're sitting in those leather chairs looking mm. at the television mm-hmm. set. Uh huh. Wow. Um. He, he has this great line, welcome to the desert of the real. You know, that, that is almost directly out of Baudrillard's book. You know, that, that we are, that, that the real, with a capital R, the real world has been uh, washed away. It's been desertified. It's been mm-hmm. deserted. We, we don't live there anymore. We live in this manufactured hyper real world filled with advertisements that are trying to convince us to buy things. And cyberpunks. Cyberpunks. Yeah. <laughs> that was that was really popular in the early two thousands, wasn't it? That whole genre. Yep, yep. <laughs> I mean, yep. There's plenty of dystopian <laughs> stories, but I don't know. It seems like a lot of the dystopian stories are are less cyberpunk, more agrarian now. Like The Walking yeah. Dead. There's not robots. Mm-hmm. The Hunger True. Games. Yeah, it's all like I don't know, man. They all they all got went away from the whole format of the Giver, you know. <laughs> oh, the Giver, I love the Giver. Mm, I, I didn't have to read it in school though. So. Oh well, that might be why. Oh, I love the Giver. So, uh, yeah, that was a lot to take in. Ooh, we went over a lot of stuff. Down. Well, well, let's talk about like what the uh, what we were talking about cyberpunks. Like that was a thing. Let's talk more about the uh, what the impact was of the movies. Oh yeah, culturally. Culturally, and I mean, it's, it had to have influenced something in technology. You know, um, I'm thinking more along the lines of you know VR headsets. <laughs> that's that's something tangible that we have right now. But then a lot of other movies popped up afterward that kind of had the same idea. Like uh, we were talking the other day about surrogates that. Uh, Oh yeah, not Bruce uh, Willis. Bruce Willis. Movie. I always yeah. get stuck on John McClane. <laughs> yeah, but, like, same here. I'm like, can we just Nakatomi? <laughs> that should just be his name. But yeah, the Bruce Willis movie, sorry, yeah. which was you know pretty similar. You're you're plugged in, but you're you're living life through a robot instead of living it in a yeah, hyper real. Re- they're still in the real world, but they're kind of living it through this filtered existence with these robots. Yeah. where they never leave their apartment. They just step into this complicated VR headset, basically, and, yeah. and send the robot out into the world to do their grocery shopping and things like that. And it's huh. a fun movie. It's a murder mystery because someone gets murdered and they it's have to figure out who did it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's you know, instead of virtual reality as in the Matrix, surrogates would be more of an augmented reality. Yeah, augmented reality. So, um, but yeah, I mean, that when we talked about doing this as a podcast, that's one of the first things that came into my mind was surrogates hmm. and uh, uh, tons of books that i've read where people get uh sucked into video games and then that becomes life you know like yeah even the uh the the remake of jumanji now yeah is going to have them get apparently get sucked into a video game they're not the board game is not coming to life in their world in their world no now they are getting sucked into the, the Jack video Black's game body. world into Jack Black's <laughs> body. Yeah, um, I don't know. We'll see. Maybe yeah. we'll maybe we'll do a different podcast on that. Um, although they were they're, kind of coincidentally, The Matrix almost had a similar kind of uh, idea in it. It wasn't going to be played up for laughs. I, I don't know how they're going to do it in Jumanji because from the trailers, there you know there's a female character who gets sucked into the video game and, and she's in a male character's body in in jumanji it looks like it's going to be a joke but in the matrix there's a one of the crew members of the nebuchadnezzar is a person called switch in one of the early drafts of the movie switch was going to be played by two people he's going to be a a a male character on one side and a female character on the other side i don't remember which was which but it was going to be male in the matrix and then female outside of the matrix or vice versa 
And for budgetary reasons or something, that I think they ran out of time with the casting, so they ended up not being able to do that. But that would have been fascinating because they talk in the movie about perceived self-image, how when you're in the Matrix, you look like you think you look like. Mm-hmm. And, you know, kind of it's your own image of yourself. Um, what you see in your own head when you look in the mirror. Yeah, uh, it, it's uh, it would have been a really cool. I, I'm kind of sad that they that it didn't work out because it would have been a really interesting, very early commentary on on some things that are very uh, very hot topics right now in, yeah. in the political conversation about transgendered issues and things like that. So it. It didn't happen, though. Uh, I mean, I, certainly knowing the the story of the Wachowskis, um, it, it it's it, it's a it's a lost opportunity that yeah. uh, that they could have made a point. But I also wonder if that wouldn't have stoked a lot of controversy that the film wouldn't have needed to battle. Yeah, true. Uh, it would have had a more of a target on it. Yeah, unfortunately, it, uh, you lose yeah. Chance, but but yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, a very early commentary. We're looking at the 90s, and yeah. this was, I feel like this really hit hard in the media in the last five years, would you say? Or um, where it's gendered just, yeah, issues? Where yeah. it just, like, just exploded on the scene. I mean, yeah, it's it's been, um, it, it has been a topic of conversation for quite a while, but it's just been within the last few years that it's really become front and center yeah. in the widespread conversation, yeah. And that that'll that'll continue. I, if I really hope they don't make another Matrix, I really hope they don't reboot it. But if they do, I would I would bet dollars to donuts that there would be uh, that that we would get to see Switch done properly. Yeah. <clears throat> While we're talking about like some of these issues, um, one of the issues that was brought up in the the film that we've been facing for the last couple hundred years, the whole man versus machine <laughs> conflict. I mean. It, you can even say that the Gutenberg press put monks out of a job. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so I mean, it, it could go way back. But man versus machine conflict. What do you What do you think about that? Oh well, what else do you have with the Matrix? But but that I mean, you've got yeah. the war of man versus the machines. <laughs> man humanity. versus digital man. Um, yeah, well, and even just for calling it that is is an interesting way to put it, isn't it? Like talking about the robots as digital man, interesting. Well, I mean, you, you think about it. It's uh, Agent Smith is a program. He's it, he's a digital man. He's, but I love how they give him so much character. That scene yeah. where he is interrogating Morpheus and he takes the earpiece out is almost going uh insane you know, like mm. the the look in hugo weaving's eyes in that scene where he's talking about how much he hates humans and how we're viruses and and how we smell bad i mean it's such a uh a non-robotic way to portray this robot man we could like segue right into tron if we wanted to <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah that's well and and that that was uh a movie that that's almost certainly had um had some influence on the wachowskis as they're working yeah. on this for another day, though, right? Yeah, it's another day. Yeah. Another day. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't know what it is about the man versus machine kind of conflict. Because, you know, every, every story is different kinds of conflict. Man versus man, man versus nature. Man versus machine always, it seems like there's an underlying sense of fear that mm-hmm. man's going to lose. You think about a lot of the conversations today about, uh, oh, I don't know, cell phones or the internet or self-driving cars or things like that. Uh, people are worried about how it's going to change our position in the natural order of things. And the Matrix really shows how how dangerous that can get yeah. when we create something that out, outpaces us and is better at surviving than we are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, there's there's only so much that, you know, humans can bodily take before they're, you know, yeah, Dead. we're, we're very then, clever, but these uh, we're, we're ugly bags of mostly water. Yeah, to that's a good throw point. a Star Trek quote out there. <laughs> um, it, it, we're we're pretty fragile creatures. Yeah. Well, I think what's scary, at least I can say this, is just how digital people, robots, technology, the power just seems to be so infinite. What do you mean? Like, you know, it, it will keep evolving and it's just, 
I don't know. I had a thought, and now so I'm lost. once it's <laughs> able to replicate itself, what's stopping it from replicating itself even more powerful? Oh yeah, you know, yeah. The whole artificial intelligence thing to where, okay, now we have. Well, that's one of the things that Elon Musk is talking about today. Also, is you know we need to regulate machines and factories, or else you know humans are just going to be down the drain. Yeah, and we're we're seeing that in uh, you're you're making me think of McDonald's now and oh, different yeah. fast food chains testing out automatic ordering systems where you don't have to talk to a person, you just go really? up and push buttons. Yeah. Like ordering food from an app. How many patties would you like? 3. Would you like bacon? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's it's going to be convenient for the consumer. It's going to be less prone to error. It's going to be great for the bosses because, you know, machines don't call in sick. But it's going to put people out of jobs. Well, there was that big turn around, I want to say, the 1950s and 1960s. I, I think of this because I think of the movie The Desk Set where uh, there's the ladies that work in the reference office and then they bring in this giant computer because, you know, it was... Yeah, back when computers yeah. took up the entire room, and on a Mack truck. <laughs> yeah, uh, they were all worried because oh, this thing's going to do our job for us. You're not going to need us anymore. And then, ironically, at the end of that movie, everybody gets their pink slip to notify that they won't be uh, coming back to work. That they're fired, and it was a mistake that a machine made in payroll. Oh. <laughs> but it was human error of some sort. But it was just kind of like, yeah, ee, that we're still having that. Uh, conflict today even though it was something that was so big back then when too. is the last time you opened up an encyclopedia like a, an actual printed encyclopedia <laughs> Ugh, i'm going to say ninth grade ninth yeah okay tenth grade tenth grade and that's because you went to public school that couldn't afford anything else um yeah and mm -hmm. my teacher was said you will get book references and encyclopedia references yeah. for this research paper well yeah but even now you can get book references online um, Di yeah. digitized uh google scans, scholar scans of books yeah, yeah. Google, google books google everything <laughs> that's the googles uh it's it, and it can be intimidating right not knowing what that's going to mean i mean at the same time we we can be hopeful though because even though it puts old ways of life to rest so to speak it, it kills the encyclopedia printers um, yeah. it also creates new things that we've never seen before like software programmers you know that's not really a job a hundred years ago but it is now and so it's it's not we're, we're not totally without hope here yeah, yeah but it is one of those but it's it's feeling like we're getting closer yeah so we have to be uh well it, yeah because it's it's um uh it's exponential it, yeah it's not it's not a linear growth the, the, the faster things change the faster they will continue to change and so it seems like we have even more reason to be careful, yeah. aware. Try to make sure that we don't cross that line. Yeah. Even though the singularity. Yeah. That we we can be uh, aware of it. And that's where mm. that's where being able to take things like, um, like the idea of the bodhisattva or yeah. the the allegory of the cave to heart and to say, all right, well, let's 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 do this, but let's go into this with eyes as wide open as possible yeah yeah let's uh let's be careful when we do this i mean we have all these cautionary tales in the movies um we're not we don't need to like run into this blindly thinking oh what's the worst that could happen well we we've seen <laughs> we've seen a lot of bad things <laughs> yeah. even if it is considered skynet. fiction for now skynet yeah. skynet whatever the, the matrix whatever the matrix the uh robots are called yeah agents the agents yeah yeah uh, or, you know, the little tentacle chop chop robots in the re in reality also. It's just... That's a technical term, right? That's a, that's a technical Tentacle term. chop chop robots. <laughs> that have the lasers that cut... I want that on a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I want the tentacle chop chop With robots. just a picture of it right underneath the words. Yeah. 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 Uh, but it, if, it, if, uh, if, if it wasn't for this movie, then we, we wouldn't have... Um, bullet time either though would we oh, yeah. I mean, it's not I it's not just a that. cultural commentary there's all sorts of cinematic techniques that we've got here oh yeah i mean think looking back it was 1999 and uh we just re-watched this movie and some of the effects are still hold up yeah they, they do were, they were great 
the uh, the bullet time though is uh, probably my favorite because I so I, I went to school to try to learn some of these effects and I racked my brain up until I finally just looked it up mm-hmm. and oh like, you tried oh. to recreate it on your own. Well, no, I didn't re- try to rec- – I just tried to, like, wrap my mind around oh. it. I'm like, how – okay, how did they do this? Did they just, like, you know, freeze frame it and go to Cinema 4D type thing or something? But, no, it was, like, dozens of cameras, at, you know, just to wrap around the subject. And they just, okay, we're just going to take one picture all at once and then pop those images in there as you would in a, a frame of a movie. And uh, I'm like <laughs> – how or who thought that up that it's like oh yeah it'll work yeah yeah i mean and it's it's kind of a mainstay in action movies now Mm -hmm. uh the 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 whole idea of of slowing things down 300 was a movie that did it really well oh yeah uh where the action's going really fast and then slow motion and and almost freezing and then going going back and speeding up again at uh dozens of movies and that's not an exaggeration no, dozens of movies have have recreated or or uh, referenced the uh you know morpheus jumping up really high in the like the crane position yeah. over neo and well i was thinking of the first five minutes of guy ritchie's sherlock holmes oh, you know yeah. where he has that inner monologue going and incapacitate the you know the uh-huh. opponent boom oh, everything yeah. slows down speeds up slows down speeds up and i you know Matrix was one of those movies that I thought of when I watched that. I was like, okay, that's pretty cool. It's, <laughs> it, it, there's a reason why so many people love The Matrix. Directors routinely reference it being on their favorite movies list. It it always shows up on best sci-fi movies of all time. Yeah. Uh, lists. So quotable. It's so quotable. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. The, the writing, um, the dialogue is wonderful and wonderfully delivered. By mm-hmm. Morpheus, especially. I mean, uh, Ke- Keanu's not not bad, um, but he mostly asks questions. Almost all, like half of his dialogue <laughs> is just him asking questions. Yeah. But Morpheus is oh, he is he is the the creepy sage, trying to disturb you into thinking for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lawrence Fishburne. Oh uh, yeah, Lawrence Fishburne, almost uh, Samuel L. Jackson. That's insane. There to think was about. a chance that uh, he was approached. There were a couple of people, and oh, and <laughs> apparently um, Neo was almost played by Will Smith, <sighs> who turned down the chance to be in this movie to go play in Wild Wild West, which definitely nowhere near as good. I actually like Wild Wild West. Yeah, same here. But uh, I'm kind of glad that that he made that choice, though. And I, and he said that he is too. He said he he no nobody but Keanu Reeves could have done what what Reeves did with yeah Yeah. and you know thinking about it you know Keanu Reeves going in and doing this as Neo in the Matrix you know it's it's hard not to think about well back then it was hard for me not to think about you know Bill and Ted yeah Keanu and I'm just kind of like if if this is just one of Ted's (laughs) dreams yeah (laughs) so like when's Napoleon come into play you know (laughs) yeah where's the phone booth so well, there's plenty of phone booths in Matrix. Right? <laughs> so, I don't know. This this movie was a turning point in a lot of ways, you know. Uh, filmmaking, uh, s- storytelling, for sure. I mean, because they were unknown as directors. And they had, yeah, they had made one other movie. Th- this was uh, the, what the Wachowskis had pitched this movie first, and I forget who it was. But they basically said, go make something else first to kind of like prove yourself so they made a movie called bound i think it was hmm. and that did pretty well and that kind of gave them the uh the social capital in hollywood to get this movie made yeah but this I'm, was i'm glad i mean bound or whatever that movie was called uh yeah clearly it didn't have the lasting impact that this one did <laughs> so th- there, this is basically there there's a reason this one start. like they pitched this one first right you know? oh absolutely <laughs> So um, well, it's definitely like a crazy story because just the amount of layers in the story, layers. the the amount like, where you just see Keanu Reeves waking up and you go, wait, what, what, huh? Yeah. Oh yeah. And then he's in the simulation of the simulation, which was just a <laughs> lot. Yeah, it was a lot. It's like Inception. 
before Inception. Yeah, yeah, that would be another movie that almost Man. certainly draws connections. Getting back ideas to this. for future ones here, future oh, podcasts. Inception. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, I'm not going to go down that rabbit trail. Yeah. Um, oh, the rabbit hole. What? Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> touche. Well, okay. So, who would you recommend this movie to? Would you recommend this movie? Is this a movie that people need to see if they haven't seen it? And who would you say this movie is for? Hey, I'm gonna, I'm just going to go out there. I mean, it's it's great for philosophy 101 students. I yep. mean, it, it got me thinking, and uh, also it you know going into like a film studies type of area. It's a great movie to watch because, like I said, there's a lot of firsts and a lot of effects that still hold up mm-hmm. that are used today. I mean, it's almost being overused. The slow motion. <laughs> That's true. You know? yeah. Actually, yeah, it's, um, it's getting to the point where the the slow motion is not not so much real as it is getting yeah, to be this hyper real. Yeah, it's just sort of kind of like oh, okay. The, the, awesome. It's been copied too many times. The photocopy is fading. Exactly, and uh, but yeah, I mean, if you're into films, if you're into philosophy, if you're into just good storytelling, this this movie's for you. As someone who just saw this movie this morning, Garrett, who would you uh, would you watch it again? I, I would watch it again. I'd finish watching it. <laughs> I'd watch the little bits that were skipped over so we could record this right now. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's still so fresh in my mind that I am still trying to wrap my head around it. I've been so quiet during this podcast just because I'm still kind of like, what did I just watch? <laughs> it, it stretches so, your mind out. What, did, yeah. what, did, what does the Oracle say? It'll uh, burn your burn your noodle or yeah. something like that? <laughs> okay, I yeah, really Friday liked her. She's like, she was my favorite character oh, yeah. she, was, thing. she was suave I, I liked her um don't worry about the base <laughs> <laughs> yeah is, is there anything you'd change about this movie is there something you know you... i don't think so i the way i kind of am thinking about it it's so 90s <laughs> that i wouldn't want to change it at all <laughs> it's what do, you, what do you mean by 90s like it's just everything well not everything but a lot of like you can tell it's from that time period, like the late nineties, just because yeah. it's dark. It deals with the, uh, the moderately newer technology. Cause like going through the phones and everything, cause everything was still dial up. Oh, that's right. Um, yeah. Do you think that if, if I think like that's a, why they had to have a hard line instead of those cell phones, if, man, if a sixth grader were to watch this movie today, would he have to ask his parents what a phone booth is? Oh, oh, that you makes know, me that's sad. Right. And I mean, then, I'm like the youngest one here, and that makes me sad. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've actually used a CRT monitor, too. You know? Yeah. Like, yeah, everything's flat intense. panel displays. And, uh, yeah. The uh, the one thing that you were mentioning, like, the it's so 90s. Like, I'm, I'm just thinking back. 2000, 2001, that cyberpunk, that sterile, either black or white, like color scheme like there was a lot of uh, a lot of that going on you know uh-huh. like and fashion wise that fashion was just wise, the, yeah that was just the style leather leather Black like the kids chains. were wearing like white sunglasses man at night at night <laughs> <laughs> and frosted tips even their hair had to be white yeah 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 i mean this was this was a popular movie for that like i think i would watch it again maybe not at 10 in the morning but uh, yeah, I think I would watch it again. Finish watching it. Maybe get some friends over and watch it with them, and tell yeah. them, "Hey, that's a that's a telephone. Yeah. <laughs> that's it's a, a landline. It's a history lesson. Yeah. yeah, that's what we call a phone cord. <laughs> yeah, even just the the noise of connecting to the matrix, like a like a modem right. noise. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I thought of. I was just like, oh. That was from when I was little. I remember that. It's like, why can't we change the ringtone on this phone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no Nokia no, noise. Yeah, it's just, that. Oh, we did make what? a lot of Nokia jokes while watching that. Yeah, it's true. I, I would admit. bet if they make the mistake of remaking the Matrix, <clears throat> they uh, can you imagine how commercialized it would be? How many? Um, how much product placement would be in here? And it would just. How many oh. of the people plugged in would be like drinking Pepsi? Exactly. Oh, <laughs> well, I just don't know yeah. how they would. By be the able way, to. this I, is not an ad. This is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's I, hashtag not spawn. Uh, I mean, if Pepsi wants to give us money, though. <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah, for sure, Pepsi, get at us. But um, I, yeah, I just it would it would ruin so much of the 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 weight of this movie. I think to have it infected. With yeah, kind of. That kind of commercialism, which again, 
Baudrillard would spin in his grave about. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think the nice thing about this movie too, though, is that it's not just for philosophy 101 students or film students that uh, a lot of this philosophical stuff is underneath the surface. You, so you can watch this movie and just think, Hey, they just ran a helicopter into the building and it exploded. That was awesome. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, like you, it's an action movie. Dude, he just got Which shot really like entertaining. 15 times. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he jumped over backwards. Oh, that was great. I mean, the fight sequences in this, we haven't even talked about the fight sequences. They oh, yeah. are wonderfully done. Very and so well done. Yes. It, it's, it, this is the perfect kind of story cauldron movie, I think, where it is an entertaining movie, which also, if you want to peel back the layers, Ooh. you can uh, you can find a lot of really heavy material to, to talk about. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is like a, a smorgasbord of... Just everything that we love about movies and stories. So, I mean, perfect. You know, and you even got Buddhism great. in there. Great. You even got Buddhism in there. Well, and sure. As the, and the wheel turns. Uh, <laughs> I, had to, I had to reference that. Sorry. I'll put, uh, I'll put some. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when, when this drops, I'll put some links up to uh, uh, some stories about guys like Chung Zhu and, and things that maybe people can, uh, mm. can read more about if they're interested. There you go. So, well, anything else that we need to talk about? Uh, I would absolutely recommend it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I would. Skipped I would over say, Anthony. I skipped over Anthony. I I would say, um, yeah. It, it's and it's a movie. I wish this movie wasn't rated R because oh, yeah. I I I wish that they could show it in high school classrooms as well because yeah. I know a lot of. A lot of high schools have problems with rated R movies because it is violent. I mean, there's lots of gunplay and things like that. Yeah, I didn't even realize that it was rated R until you guys told me because I was yeah. expecting like something that, you know, scandalous, I but it was just violence. Think there's not a single F bomb in it. Is no, there? that's what I was waiting for. Yeah, I kind yeah. of think of it. So it's, it's, um, I, I think it's one of those movies like we've kind of shown here that can provoke a lot of really interesting conversations. So. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're not looking for an interesting conversation, it's it's just a fun fun action flick too. It's a good way to kill a couple hours and uh, enjoy a movie. So my mind's blown. So and <laughs> that mind. was before we even Free started this. <laughs> <laughs> but um, all right, well, I guess that brings us up to the end of the hour, really. Um, so if you guys like what you are hearing, subscribe to the podcast and, uh, don't be afraid to be vocal and, uh, let us know of anything else that you guys would want to hear about. And, uh, we're always looking for some ideas for some new shows. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on Instagram or Facebook, The Story Cauldron. And, uh, watch The Matrix. It's and really watch The good. Matrix. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys. And, uh, until next time, I'm Bobby. I'm Anthony. I'm Gary. All right. See you later. Bye. Bye.